Coming up on the Stiefel Snow Show, we are bringing you some of the biggest stories and brightest stars in snow sports. Fast on your Deer Valley seatbelts, it's going to be a bumpy and high-flying moguls ride on the Utah Resort's world-renowned slopes. And winter is coming. For Winter Vinecki, there's every reason to turn, turn, turn for this seasoned aerialist. Then more U.S. home soil majestic action at Mammoth Mountain in the nation's aptly named Golden State. Take a little seat. We are going back to Cali. Welcome back to the Stiefel Snow Show. Glad to have you with us. I'm Anna Jackson coming to you with the latest and greatest in skiing and snowboarding from around the world. So where is the U.S. ski and snowboard team? Well, on some of the most legendary slopes across the globe, of course. First up, it is Gudari, the Georgian resort hosting snowboard cross in the greater Caucasus Mountains. Then to Mammoth Mountain, California, where we'll get in on some Toyota U.S. Grand Prix action. And in Valley, Utah, the Super Bowl of freestyle skiing on the Moguls World Cup calendar. Touchdown, but make it snow sports. 21-year-old mogul skier Dylan Marcellini from Walnut Creek, California, is undoubtedly a one-to-watch freestyler. Marcellini had his best World Cup finish last year in Deer Valley, taking fourth in moguls. His previous best in jewels, well, that was 15th. So we caught up with Marcellini to get a sense of the electricity running through this nighttime venue under the lights. Let's take a listen. I'm Dylan Marcellini of the U.S. Stiefel Freestyle Ski Team. Look at those fresh jumps. This is my favorite course on tour, Deer Valley. They've been calling this the Super Bowl of our sport, Freestyle Moguls. We get the most fans out here. It's definitely pretty awesome skiing in front of the hometown crowd. It's really fun to be able to hear them all at the bottom. It's one of the hardest courses. There's always a lot of crashes, a lot of carnage that goes on. It's definitely one of the most entertaining. Today I've been working on just getting used to this new line that I'm skiing. For duels we have to ski both the red course and the blue course. Every course is definitely completely different. That's one of the biggest things for us is just showing up at World Cup after World Cup and having to figure out how each course skis. Every country builds them differently. Aerial side over here. Those people are crazy. We run stretch, open up the hamstrings. Here's Mr. Dylan Walzak. Rolling up late as usual. Nice and soft. That's a little punchy. This is a good course for me. I've been skiing on this thing for a long time, so I know the pattern now. There we go. <laughs> Big night for American Dylan Marcellini. Here we go. It's like riding the toughest bull in a rodeo. Wow. Dylan Marcellini, he finds the podium the first of his career. Coaches are awesome, and all of them have been working really hard with me for the last year. It's awesome to be able to put things together when I'm like house. Good stuff. Well, the U.S. women's moguls team pulled up in full force to Park City as well, delivering dominant performances to the spirited Deer Valley crowd. Energy running high on the renowned champion course of the 2002 Olympic venue. The women threw down all inspiring tricks throughout competition, striking a whole lot of red hot balance along the way. The Alta Wyoming native 2022 Olympic silver medalist Jalen Koff starting second to last with a big smile nice and loose on the course pushed incredibly hard on her run. She was looking for a win and well it showed. The crowd responded many holding bamboo stick with a giant J's made by Jalen's dad. But it seemed 2022 Olympian Olivia Giaccio was looking to swoop in as the last competitor of the super final. Skiing an impressive run throughout it was on the second hit that Giaccio threw a cork 1080, landing flawlessly to win the competition. Giaccio became the first woman to win a moguls competition with a cork 1080, calling it something she'd dreamed of. The 23-year-old from Reading, Connecticut, perhaps recalling a little blue book that she would write her Olympic dreams in at 10 years old.
by all accounts, Windsor Vanecki has been a determined athlete since just the age of five. Running races morphed into triathlons, with Vanecki eventually hitting the slopes. Now, that determination translated to successful aerials performances, and Deer Valley was no exception for the 2022 Beijing Olympian and law school student. So a quick study in strength of purpose and practice across the board and the Necky looking resolute in her gaze and stance showed incredible form on the slope. But it was her back double full full that put her forward to win the aerials event. Her third World Cup win in the discipline eliciting lots of smiles at top of the podium with Australia's Danielle Scott and Abby Wilcox taking second and third. Well, after the break, joining us in studio, we will get to chat with two-time Olympian and U.S. Ski and Snowboard Hall of Famer Trace Worthington. Stay with us to talk freestyle skiing at prestigious Deer Valley and more right here on the Stiefel Snow Show. I think he's had a couple of coffees today. We are back with an exciting look at all the best moments on home soil for the U.S. freestylers. The crowd, family and friends are like just as pumped up out in full support of the athletes. Always a thrilling atmosphere under the lights. So with that, I'm so pleased to say joining us in studio today, we have got two-time Olympian, 37 World Cup winning freestyle skiing legend Trace Worthington. Trace, so good to have you here. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, now, we know this, but maybe not many people know this. You're also the great-grandson of 1912 Olympian Harry Worthington. You've yeah. got quite the Olympic lineage, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's pretty cool. It's a, it's a cool legacy. Um, but yeah, he was in track and field, so you know, I got into skiing somehow. Yeah, but it's been, amazing. It's been well, we are fun. in absolutely fine company. Right. Well, let's just jump straight to it. One of the coolest moments that, that we saw at Deer Valley, that was Olivia Giaccio throwing that yeah. cork 1080. She landed it perfectly to win the competition. The first woman that we've ever seen in history land and win a competition uh, throwing that move. How <laughs> impressive. Just talk us through what she just achieved. I was so psyched to see this. I mean, first of all, you have the two mogul jumps within the mogul field. I mean, that, that, that mogul run called champion at Deer Valley is, is long, it's steep, it's long. It's the, it's the craziest, hardest, most difficult mogul course in the world. And so coming down that run at 25 to like 30 miles per hour into this bottom air right here to, to stop your mind and focus and to do a cork 1080 right here. She goes one revolution. Follow her toes right now, okay? So that's one spin. Then she comes around, there's another spin right there, but she's also inverted, so that adds another element and another spin. After going down that long mogul course, it's so physically demanding, and to be able to do that and pull it off and how smooth she is coming through the finish was amazing to watch. The crowd went absolutely nuts, but a cork 1080, obviously, you know, three times 360, mm -hmm. so 1080, and uh, she hit it. It was it was awesome. So very special. A yeah. little bit of history that we witnessed there. I mean, she is a force to be reckoned with. But let's move to our fast facts powered by iFit. Welcome to the world of intelligent fitness. Canada's Mikhail Kingsbury uh, just made history with an 87th World Cup victory at Deer Valley. Again, we talk about dominance, but he really and truly is. He's now put himself ahead of legend alpine skier Ingemar Stenmark. He's just unstoppable. Put this into context for us. He is, he's a machine. Mikhail is our Michaela Schifrin, mm -hmm. right? Like mm -hmm. he's just dominant, he's strong, he's consistent. He continues to go top to bottom, A to Z, and put the whole package together in mogul skiing. And uh, he's healthy. You can't break records unless you're healthy and strong. Right, right? yeah. <laughs> Ridiculously impressive. Yeah. And Park City local as well, Nick Page, got to mention him. 21 years of age. Give us a sense of his trajectory and sort of where he's going. Well, you look at Mikhail Kingsbury, you look at Ikuma Horishima of Japan, the guys who are dominating, Walter Wahlberg. And Nick, like Olivia Giaccio, you have to find that thing to kind of defeat Jakar Anthony, and that's that Cork 1080. Um, so Nick is now throwing this cork 1440. So this is what Olivia did, but add another twist to it. Again, Nick is coming into this at about 35 miles per hour, comes into this bottom air, and you watch his toes. So again, there's one revolution, and he's just sideways and all corked up. He has the crossing the skis to add style to it. There's revolution number two. So he's at a 720 right now in terms of rotations, and he comes around and does a third rotation, and again, when you add that flip in that inverted maneuver, that adds the other twist, or that adds the other rotation, and that's where you get 1440. But for Nick to do this, and he landed, see that little off landing right there? 
that's why he didn't win the event, right? Mm -hmm. Just that little teeny mistake. Mikhail Kingsbury and the other guys aren't making those small mistakes. But they're also not trying these things. So risk versus reward, that will pay off in the future for Nick Page to be able to do that trick and do it consistently. Then he'll be on the top of the podium. Yeah, it takes such yeah. a trained eye to notice those finite little details just because, you know, for the typical moguls fan, it just looks insanely yeah. impressive. And, and it truly, yeah. truly is. Uh, now, we haven't brought you here just for a bit of fun. We want you to teach us a, a couple of things, Trace. First yeah. of all, yeah. you saw perfectly there. So these little bits of pine. Yeah, so a lot of people maybe think that's dirt. There's, like, oh man, what's all the dark spots all over the run? Well, those dark spots are pine boughs. So right. chopped up pine boughs, and the officials throw those on the course. That is to see that because the ruts are so deep in mogul skiing, the contrast helps a ton to be able to see the contour of the run and the contour of the moguls. So it just helps with that depth perception as well. You're right. I think I have often sometimes maybe thought that was just a little bit of dirt on the run, but it's clearly there yeah. uh, for a very specific reason. <laughs> uh, well, Trace, thank you so much. And it's been so fun having yeah. you here. As always, we love having you on the show. Thank you for your insight. We've learned a few things as well. So um, safe travels. I know you're off somewhere soon. So uh, thank you so much again. Thank you. Well, stay with us. We've got not one but two American greats in snowboarding joining us. Olympians Lindsay Jacobellis and Nick Baumgartner taking time out to join us in discussion from Southern California and Upper Peninsula, Michigan, respectively. More when we come back. And Nick Baumgartner is that much closer to winning his first Olympic medal. Yeah! Let's go! This is where Lindsay shines. Come on, girl! She's got the pass. Now Lindsay she's just going to work to the finish. In gold medal position, it is gold for the United States. Lindsay Jacob Ellis, twice golden. And for Nick Baumgartner, the 40 year old, a long awaited Olympic metal now a reality how about that what a story what an achievement and i'm so pleased that we have got both lindsay and nick joining us now uh, guys it is so good to see you thank you so much for joining us you are both olympians you are both snowboarding powerhouses so this really is such a treat for us um, this afternoon i just want to start first by taking you back to beijing of course that moment when you both made history for your win at the first ever mixed team snowboard cross competition to be held at any winter olympic games just amazing stuff and nick going to come to you first tell us just about that moment and the emotions that reliving that brings out yeah it brings out a lot of emotions because um i had four chances at an olympic medal and and couldn't make it happen and i showed devastation after my individual um loss taking 10th place and then getting another chance 48 hours later to do this um, not only with myself but to do it with a teammate someone that i had traveled the globe with for so many years was incredible and one of the most amazing things i've ever gotten to do in my entire life what about you, Lindsay? How do you reflect on that moment? I was just coming off of this incredible high of my individual and didn't really have a lot of stress until I got in the gate and was thinking, oh, wait, Nick's going to want a medal. So I should really pay attention and uh, put, uh, put it together for him and, and give it my best. So I, I think that also helped me stay relatively calm until I had to perform again. Yeah, and stepped up. You truly did, Lindsay. Just to stick with you, I mean, as a two-time Olympic gold medalist, you've had such an often discussed and debated arc in your Olympic journey, starting, you know, as a 20-year-old in Torino. Just talk a little bit about that period and just the, the ebbs and flows of your career from there on. Well, yes, as you said, 20 years old was my first Olympic debut in 2006, and I had a lot of pressure going into that, and I was just a little ignorant and naive of how I was emotionally prepared for that moment, and making that mistake when I was 20 years old uh, definitely haunted me for a really long time, so it took a lot of growth and a lot of maturity over, you know, 16 years to figure out how it's all going to come together for me so it was just a beautiful moment and nick you know we always have to talk about age and sport that's just what we do but you were the oldest u.s olympian in beijing at the age of 40. just speak about the journey that you've been on and, and how all that hard work has paid off 
Yeah, it's definitely, it's been a lot of work when you put so much into a dream for so long and you fall short so many times, it can, it can beat you up and it can, um, and it can make you even start to question yourself and then to go there and to have that individual race not go my way and, and show that emotion and, um, and then to come back and get that other opportunity and to capitalize on it. Now I have people come up to me saying that our performance changed their life. I mean, that's just crazy to think. Now, we are two years from Beijing. We're another two years until uh, Cortina. Any chance, Lindsay, going to put you on the spot, any chance we're going to see you in 2026? You know, I've had the same attitude for the last 18 years, that I'm taking one year at a time, listening to my body, and if it lines up that I'm there in the start gate, then that's incredible. I think a wonderful thing about border crossing something that Nick and I have is the experience and knowing those little details can give us the longevity in the sport that we have had and the success that we've had. Yeah, well said. What do you think, Nick? Do you think you're going to be showing the youngsters how it's done in a couple of years? Well, I promise you I'm going to do everything in my power. And um, yes, at my age, I'm not fast on every course. I got to find those courses that suit me. And um, and, and when I do find those ones, uh, you can't count me out because if you do, I promise you it's going to bite you in the butt. There's nothing worse for a young athlete to get than to get beat by someone older than their parents. I think there's a good chance I'll be there. I believe it, Nick. I think the viewers at home believe it. And I think the, uh, <laughs> the younger members of the team believe it as well. And Lindsay, we've sort of touched on this already, but I know you're also an author. Uh, your book, Unforgiving, has been described as a, a story of self-growth, sort of revealing the secret of your resilience from disappointment to triumph, which you mentioned uh, a moment ago. But do you think that is an accurate summary of your story? I do. And it was a moment for me to have to really face what happened in 2006 and to really unpack it myself. And if my story teaches anything to anyone is to just not give up on yourself and to find ways to continue to grow and to push the level for yourself and just know who you truly are as an individual. Yeah, it doesn't matter who you are. That's such an important message. And Nick, I know you've also put uh, pen to paper. Your book, Gold from Iron, showcases your humble beginnings. I know as a dad, you've called your son Landon, sort of your reason why, which so many of us can relate to. Just tell us a little bit about how these sort of seminal life experiences have shaped your story. Really, when I had my son at 22 years old, it changed everything. It made it more about... Um, about not just about me, it was about my son. Not only did I have to provide for this kid and be successful and be able to earn enough money to support my son, but kids don't listen to their parents. But the one thing they do is they're always watching us. And um, I needed to lead by example and to show my son what was possible. If you're willing to let go of the excuses of, I'm from too small of a town in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. My local ski hill is less than 400 feet tall. I needed to show him that what is possible if you're willing to outwork everyone, let go of the excuses and go get what you want. That's right. Well, both of you just keep doing what you are doing. Nick and Lindsay, thank you so much for joining us, sharing your story again with us. Both such inspirational athletes. And I have to say, I think there's a lot of us at home hoping that we see you in Cortina. So thank you again for your time and uh, safe travels. Thank you guys very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Well, California, here we come and on to Mammoth Mountain for all the free ski and snowboarding action-packed high-flying tricks, elite level styling daredevils, all of them. We will see you back after the break. Welcome to Mammoth. As you can see, it's pretty blustery out here and uh, we definitely need the snow, so I'm thankful for it. Not great to have it going on when we're trying to pull off some competitions, but we're going to do our best and since it's a day off today, I figured I'd go get some turns. Here we go. Y'all, there's some fresh snow out there and somebody's got to squash it down. 
How about that? So with weather cancelling events, final results came from the qualification numbers posted earlier this week. Nick Gepper, who switched from slope style to half pipe after a brief retirement, had a clean run in jeans, no less, but now a signature for the three-time Olympic medalist. Bend Oregon's Hunter Hess having a successful season on the circuit and recently added an X Games bronze also showcased a solid and agile run. But it was Aspen's Alex Ferreira who would be the one to beat the two-time Olympic medalist in the end, pulling out all the stops for the top spot on the podium, leaving Hess in second and Gepper in third with his first World Cup podium in halfpipe. David Wise was just off the podium in fourth with the next four spots also claimed by Americans. And if you're here for gravity-defying feats on the slopes, we have got you. U.S. Olympic silver medalist Colby Stevenson laying down a technically impressive run at smooth on the rails, carrying speed and agility into his jump section. But would it be enough to challenge teammate and reigning Olympic gold medalist in free ski slope style Alex Hall? While Hall's focus evident as he maintains speed throughout despite a slight headwind on the course, and all in, Hall earned his first World Cup free ski slope style victory since taking gold in Beijing. Leading a US 1 2 with Stevenson and Switzerland's Andre Ragetli took third. Well, let's take a look at some other notable results from Mammoth, including Americans Eleanor Andrews and Jay Riccamini taking second and third in the women's free ski slope style event. This was Andrews' first World Cup and Riccamini's second straight podium. In women's snowboard halfpipe, Maddie Mastro took bronze ahead of her teenage teammate, B. Kim. Well, what do members of the U.S. men's alpine ski team do when they have little time off the slopes? Well, they head to the beach, of course, change of scenery and temperature under the Tuscan sun in Via Reggio, Italy. But add in some volleyball, human pyramids, beach walks and sunsets and make it a mini respite. And also an announcement on social from Olympic alpine skier Michaela Schifrin on the perils of demands and fatigue on athletes. Schifrin will sit out sold out in Andorra this weekend, giving herself a bit more rehabilitation time following a downhill crash in Cortina on the 2026 Olympics course that left her hospitalized with a knee injury. We are wishing her a full recovery and looking forward to her return to competition. Well, digital or old school desktop calendar, either way, make a note to join us for all the exciting coverage on CNBC and NBC from Mammoth Mountain Ski Jumping, from Storied Lake Placid and Cross Country Skiing's World Cup, making a stop in Jesse Diggins' home state. Well, it has been an absolute pleasure being with you here today on the Seafall Snow Show. I'm Anna Jackson and we will see you next week. Take care.